Welcome to the latest episode of Lateral Think, brought to you by Melbourne Athletic Development. Melbourne Athletic Development is a sports and injury management clinic based in Melbourne, Australia. To maximise your performance, optimise your injury management, contact the team at Melbourne Athletic Development. As many of you know, Jack and I have a very diverse understanding across multiple areas of practice, whether they relate to sports performance, say for instance with my background in track coaching, or with Jack and his background in yoga practice. We've combined a lot of this knowledge over time with our clinical and sports performance experiences to really develop what we do. And as you know, we love education. So what we've tried to do is take that knowledge and put it into an online learning community. We think this is important because it's an opportunity for people to interact, learn, and upskill as they try to improve the practice of what they do. So if this is something that you would be interested in doing, head to melbourneathleticdevelopment.com.au forward slash education and get an understanding of how you can upskill your current practice. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. Today, we're extremely lucky to be joined by Dr. Luke Wilkins. Luke, can you give us a little bit of background about who you are and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Thanks for having me. So I'm Dr. Luke Wilkins. I am a lecturer in sport and exercise science at La Trobe University. Um, As you can tell from the accent, I am not from Australia. I'm actually English. I moved over about six months ago. I was working at Nottingham Trent University, doing a similar sort of thing. Um, The teaching area tends to be the sort of sports psychology side of things, as opposed to, you know, the physiology or nutritional biomechanics things. Um, Prior to that, I was at the New York Yankees. I've worked there for a couple of years. Uh, Absolutely loved that place. Um, Would have stayed for longer, but my wife was unable to get a work visa. So it was basically wife or job. And I went I went with Charles, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Well, she's got the Australian citizenship, so I'm now joining I've now come to Australia um and I'm gaining the benefits of her Australian citizenship. So like, you know, it's it swings and roundabouts really, isn't it? So it's it's fine. It was a good decision long run, I think. What did you enjoy about working at the New York Yankees? And and what were you doing there actually? Mm. Yeah, so I had a couple of roles there. Um, My actual title was Vision, Perception and Cognition Coach. Uh, I think the coach element was just for visa purposes uh, to get me into the country because I definitely didn't do any coaching. But it was to do with, you know, how can we test these players on their visual skills? Um, How can we train them on those skills? So we think we're talking things like reaction time here, anticipation, their gaze behavior, so where they're looking throughout when they throw a ball or when they hit a ball, when they field, um, those sorts of things. And then the second element to it was to act as a sort of skill acquisition specialist. So, you know, teaching and educating not just the players, but the coaches on principles of skill acquisition, how they can be implemented into practice um, and sort of guide those efforts into sort of becoming a more evidence-based uh, training. All right, let's let's dive into that because that's super interesting. What are the key things that you did find about what players did well who were performing at a high level? What were the players not doing who were not performing at a high level? And then what were some of the strategies that you were able to put in place um, with, you know, upskilling the coaches on how to implement strategies that would improve performance for the players? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, good questions, I should say. Uh, there was There's a few things that I think when you're around elite sport, you begin to notice about the best players. And, and some of them are just simply that they are super competitive. Now, that takes it outside of my sort of area, but it's an important sort of factor to acknowledge is that, you know, I, I feel I'm competitive. I always thought I was a competitive person. Most people think they're competitive people, but you take it to those elite levels and, and it's an obsession, like it's yeah. it's to the nth degree. Um, so that's always, you know, people do ask that and that's always the first thing I, I come to think of. In terms of specifically to my area, I think what you sometimes find is that 
the players that perhaps don't make the most of their potential are the ones that are choosing, and it's, you know, do you try and phrase this delicately and everything, but no, maybe, it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gone are the days of sitting on the fence. Eh? Um, yeah. So the easy, the, there's loads of different routes you can go down in training and it's, you know, you can challenge yourself and you can maybe take the slightly easier road. And to bring that back to baseball, if people are familiar with baseball, you've got the idea of working with a T. So I don't know how familiar you guys are or your audience would be, um, but basically practicing by hitting a ball off a stationary T. Now, to anyone not in baseball or to most people not in baseball, that would seem madness. How can you learn to hit a 90 mile an hour ball by practicing with a stationary object. Um, but it is, it's the way that baseball batters have practiced for 150 years. And it is the way that some of them still want to practice. And the problem we have, or we have as coaches is, is to say, okay, just because that's what used to be do, done. And just because, you know, X, Y, and Z made it to the pros doing that way doesn't mean that that's the way that's most effective. And so I, going back to what you asked about, you know, what, what are the difference between the people that do make it and the people that don't make it? I think the people that do make it are the ones that, you know, when they go and practice on a Monday, they're like, okay, give me that 95 mile, mile per hour machine. Give me this, give me that, give me those things that are going to really push me and make me sort of challenge me to my limits as opposed to the others who maybe don't want to get challenged and maybe want to focus on things that they can already do and that give them confidence as opposed to necessarily um, learning. So if we steal, you know, uh, the terminology from Carol Dweck's work, you know, they're much more in that growth mindset when it comes to their performance. Yeah, I, I think so. And um, we actually collected a bit of data, uh, unpublished data, I'll, I'll add though, uh, from before I was at the New York Yankees when I was up in Newcastle over in England and um, we did some work with their academy players there and we collected some mindset data and we compared that with student mindset data and, the, and those soccer players, those academy soccer players had that growth mindset that was significantly higher than a student's and that, uh, that sort of belief that, you know, they can challenge themselves and, and get better and that failure wasn't the end of it and, um, you know, hard work was important and, and those sort of attributes that, that, that are important going forwards. I was going to actually ask based on that, do you think that mindset leads to well, certainly behavioral changes, but also does that psychological mindset also enhance the, the brain's ability, ability to be plastic and adapt and be able to develop or build skill acquisition more as well? Uh, I don't think it changes the brain's ability to adapt. Like the brain is an adapter, you know, it's, it's, it's highly plastic, uh, it's high in plasticity, it's, it's adaptable. So mm. whether or not you believe that, it's still going to be the case that it, that is, um, that is the situation. I guess maybe if you believe it, then you're more likely to uh, embrace opportunities that enhance it or embrace opportunities that, that foster that sort of um, plasticity uh, or experiences that sort of encourage it anyway is, is probably maybe the better way of terming it. Um, what was the, was the second part of that question that I think I forgot? <laughs> well, no, like it was, it was more just thinking about how my, we were actually talking about this in a previous podcast, John and I, but thinking about how psychology influences changes in, in adaptation. And one of the elements of that growth mindset is it will create behavioral change. You, you'll, you'll be someone who's much more willing to put yourself in uncomfortable situations to develop the skills that you need. But I was also just interested to think of, does that psychological mindset create even a higher amount of plasticity within the brain? Like it is obviously something that is adaptable um, by definition, but can it actually be further enhanced by that ability to actually based on whether you're someone who thinks you can change versus someone who cannot. Yeah, that's an interesting one. And and there are people that are far more knowledgeable of, than me who would be able to answer this better. Um, my my thoughts is that, 
you know, that growth mindset is the thing that puts you into experiences and puts you into opportunities that enhance that and allow that. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting. I hadn't really thought of it from sort of that perspective. So um, maybe that's some, some digging that I can do after this. <laughs> Just to add to the already quite broad collection of things <laughs> that you do, hey, Luke? Well, yeah, yeah. Just needed a strand to the bow. The, the question that I have then is, what were the things that you were able to pick up in terms of their visual perception? And were there strategies that built off that, you know, that idea that we just spoke about of them wanting to learn what they could could improve to improve their baseball performance? Yeah, so I think, you know, we, we were working, majority of the time we were working with some of the younger guys at the Yankees. And some of those younger guys are now making it into into the big leagues and a few of the guys were, were key, key figures last year. Um, and we, we did do some work with them, you know, looking at their gaze behaviour via virtual reality batting um, and it was really cool to see because the, because we can put them in a VR environment and because we can track their eyes and their gaze behavior in that manner, we actually can see that there's multiple ways to achieve the skill, right? And so one hitter can be really good at making good contact because he can watch the ball onto the bat nine times out of 10. Whereas another guy equally good at watching the ball onto the bat, or sorry, equally good at making contact, but it's because he can pick it up out of the hand, again, nine times out of 10. And so yeah. there's multiple ways to be good at a skill. Skills are multidimensional like that. And what that means from our sports science perspective is that, okay, we're identifying ways that we can individualize their training, okay? And that was probably the coolest part from the stuff that we did in that second season of mine is that, we were like, okay, we know this guy struggles to read that last third of the flight. What can we do specifically for him that works on that element? Okay, we know this guy struggles to read it out of the hand. What can we do to focus here? So it's individualizing that training um, because of the data we're getting from all these different tools that look at their gaze behavior, which is, uh, I find it fascinating anyway. No, no, definitely is. I think it, it, it highlights really clearly that in elite sport, the big shift that is happening and it's going to only get better with technology is this individualization, individual profiling, um, and the ability to, to really drive changes in someone's performance. And obviously you hope that that amalgamates into team performance as well in that kind of setting. Um, but I think that that's where this integration between sports science and coaching is going to get closer and closer and closer so that your able to actually get really, really strong outcomes from identifying what that individual kind of needs. So that, that's really interesting. Are there any examples that you have of, you know, the implementation side of it? Like, did you have anyone that you, you know, you identified and you said, oh, you know, we found this and we think that we could try, try and implement this. But then, as you said, from a psychological perspective, they were pushing back on on wanting to actually adjust their behavior because I know that baseball particularly is filled with historicism and you know like people having all of these really peculiar rituals that they they tend to to want to use and so changing may actually be uncomfortable for people in that setting yeah yeah <laughs> you spot on there um one nice example that we did have was going back to that point we you know we found out there was a player who if we could improve his ability to watch the ball onto the bat, then we think based on everything else, he would improve. So we got a baseball bat, we wrapped seven different color pieces of tape around the end of the bat um, in sort of even cylinders. And his target every time he hit the ball was to say which color of that tape was the one that he hit it with, just to try and sort of force those eyes to be looking at the point of contact when he hits it. And so we had seven different colors piece of tape. There was yellow, pink, green, blue, red, and really nice idea. And I spoke to a few folks about it and we, we started using it with a few players. And then we wanted to use it with another player. And one of the other coaches said, the yellows and the pinks and the, the reds, they have to go. <laughs> you, this player might do it if it's just blue, gray and black tape. <laughs> but 
it's not going to work otherwise. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it, it's just little things like that, which I think are quite funny. And, and just, you just, just, you when just you don't say, think that's going to be relevant, really, do you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, I, I definitely didn't. But, it, you know, that's, that's why coaches are so important, because coaches have that man management feel with the players. Yeah. They, they know, you know, they know the players better than, than I do and sports scientists do. And that's why it's great to work together, I guess. So it's, it's a funny one. It's a bit of a jokey one. But at the same time, like, that's still really useful input. And the next time I, uh, I think he sent me a picture the other day and it had, he sent me a picture of a bat and it was blue, gray and black tape around the side of it. So. <laughs> and and did, like from the actual outcome, was it effective for those players to pick up some of those changes in where they were contacting the ball? Uh, I, we don't know. This is sort of, you know, so ongoing, ongoing pilot stuff um, to the point where, you know, we weren't really tracking it either. Um, we were doing so much experimentation and just, you know, do we think it could work? You know, as long as we don't think it's going to have a negative impact, then let's have a bit of fun with this. And if the player's on board, then, then great. Was actually like based on that. Was that one of the things that you really enjoyed about this environment? Because because you're working in a, a practical setting in a sports setting, there's a real opportunity for innovation. There's a real opportunity for experimentation. Was that one of the things that you really valued about that environment? Yes, but that was driven by the people that were there. Like I was so fortunate that the people who were saying yes and no to things were super progressive, super, um, you know, they didn't micromanage. They sort of trusted you. They gave you the freedom to do things. Um, they were hundred percent on board with this scientific evidence-based approach to things. Um, and that's not at the expense of sort of feel and tradition and intuition. Um, but they were very progressive and very, um, very supportive of everything like that. But yeah, you know, that is what was great about it. But it was because of the people that were there that um, allowed it to happen, basically. That's not always, unfortunately, that's not always that common, I think, in elite settings. Some people are very protective of their patch. So it's good that you were able to, to, to do that. And I feel like as someone who works in sports performance, it would be hard uh, to go into an environment when you have ideas and you have hypotheses that you want to test to get ultimate improvements, but it doesn't always uh, actually occur because people don't want to actually try things. Um, yeah, and it can only be, it only needs to be one or two people as well that don't agree. You could have 20 people on your side, but one or two important people aren't on the same wavelength or aren't singing from the same hymn sheet, then, you know, that's it. That's the important one. So. I think on... You know, obviously we're talking about skill acquisition through, you know, visual uh, tracking. Do you think this is something that, I know it's become more popular in the research and skill acquisition. Do you think it's something that is undervalued sometimes when we're looking at how someone performs? I think so. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to answer that because I feel like I'm just inherently biased from my experiences. So yeah, we all I are. feel, yeah, like I feel like, my, my obvious answer is yes, but then I've got to try and rein that in a bit with, with the obvious bias that I have. But, you know, I, I just think of you know, my main sport is soccer in, in terms of my interests and my knowledge. And I just think of some of the best players who have ever played the game. And it's the likes of Iniesta, Messi, people like that. They're, they're not big. They're not strong. They're not, you know quick or, or, or whatever it is. They, they don't even sometimes have all-round games in terms of being able to head the ball, you know, use both feet, yeah, probably, but, you know, there's, there's players that are better than that. But what they have is they have that brain and they have that vision and they can see things that even on TV with a view of the whole pitch, the rest of us can't, let alone on the pitch with everyone around you. Um, and so I think of examples like that and I just think that shows to me the importance of it, um, especially at that elite level. Well, I was going to say, it, it's also interesting to note, though, that you described, say, some of the elite soccer and football players where they may not have necessarily the physical attributes. But I also wonder, are they some of the prerequisites needed because it forces those people to find um, skills 
to be separate able to themselves. separate themselves mm. from the, from the people that might have more physical tools than them. Yeah, this is um. So I've just finished teaching on my talent identification and development module uh, subject, mm. sorry, and this is an exact sort of conversation that we have. And you know, how do those people that aren't as physically gifted as the others uh, make it? Make it to the mm. top, and you know, part of it is compensation of technical skills. Part of it is compensation of psychological skills. Um, you've got the whole idea of being the underdog effect and developing resilience because you're smaller and mm. you know, the barriers that you have to overcome that maybe six foot five guys uh, don't have to do. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's definitely an element of that for sure. Yeah, I think of that in like in say like the NBA where there is actually certain physical requirements you need to be able to perform at that level but often some of the elite players who might be very tall they're like six foot ten throughout their high schooling career they may have been six foot and they played more of a guard position so they developed a lot of skill sets but then between the ages of 15 to 18 they grew from six foot to six foot ten so they have that mm. skill sets from being a relatively smaller frame and then it can actually transfer it into now in a much bigger body yeah, so definitely. The development of different time points. Yeah, definitely. I agree. <laughs> the um the thing that you made me think of when you mentioned some of these players who can see things that we can't see. And correct me if my understanding is limited, and and you probably could say, well, yeah, duh. But essentially, is it that these people have so much experience that they're predicting what's going to happen? Um, in the same cases, what happens often, say, for instance, when you look at chess players where they're so aware of, you know, the next moves that are coming and the probability of, you know, positions being had that they know what outcomes will be. So as a, as a player, they know that if they pass the ball to a certain zone, the probability is that their teammate will be there based on the previous experiences. Or is it that they actually have better visual perception skills? Um, do we know that or is it we're not sure yet? Um so I don't think we're sure yet, you know, that there is literature that's looked at these sorts of things, um, but it's, there's, you know, there's not a general consensus on a lot of, you know, on a lot of the specifics, on a lot of the specific factors, um, particularly in terms of, you know, asking about visual hardware. So just I'll sidetrack a second. When we talk about vision and perception and cognition, a lot of the time we can break it down into vision, visual hardware, and visual software. Visual hardware being sort of the optometric properties of the eye that are a bit more innate, like, you know, your visual acuity. So they start, when you go to the opticians and you look at that chart with the letters, that would be your visual acuity. That is a little bit more um, innate and, and it's difficult to change. Whereas things like where you look and uh, complex decision making is more like a software skill, something that you can train, you can improve on. Um, generally speaking, we do find that elite athletes are better at those sorts of things. Now, where does that come from? To answer your point, yes, experience is going to be a huge factor to this. But, and again, apologies for using soccer terms, um, but people like Cesc Fabregas, Jack Wilshire, these guys were making, you know, defence splitting passes at the ages of 17, 18, 19. So it can't just be a experience thing um perhaps there's an element of sort of creativity maybe maybe these guys have a have a knack for seeing things or knack of uh, interpreting things and, and and i say seeing but i mean more i guess perceiving things um it's it's a question that you know we do need to do more uh, research on in terms of exactly where are the superior abilities coming from you know, what are those underlying mechanisms behind it? Uh, yeah, it's a really good question. One of the areas of research you've done is, which I actually had never even heard of before, is the uh, troboscopic, is it? Visual training? Yeah. I, I, I was interested, like, could, could you actually explain what that is? And did you actually use that, like, say, for instance, at your time at the Yankees or elsewhere? Yeah, so this actually came about during my PhD after my first study. I think I was really big into the NFL at the time. Still am a little bit. Uh, I was watching just random video clips on YouTube and I came across a video of Larry Fitzgerald wearing these funny looking glasses, catching balls, and they were Nike glasses. 
and the glasses were flickering, basically, producing a stroboscopic effect. And I looked into it and it, they were what they called the Nike Spark Vapor Strobes at the time. Basically, stroboscopic glasses. Um, think, you know, nightclub strobe lights, that sort of thing. Mm. And they had been brought out by Nike as a sports training tool with the premise that if you practice under difficult visual conditions, you will improve, you know, on skills such as catching. Um, it's a little bit akin to saying, if you go out jogging with weights on your ankles and then take them off and then go jogging again, it feels easier. Now, I won't go into the science behind that sort of thing, but that's the kind of logic you train with impoverished vision. You train in the conditions where, you know, the, the, the world looks like it's flicking before you and then take them off. Next time someone throws a football at you or a tennis ball or a baseball at you, it, it feels easier. And anecdotally, whenever we work with people, that's exactly what they said. Now, does that come out in the scientific research? Very questionable. Um, it's 50-50 at best, I would probably say. Does that, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not doing anything though. Um, and I think there's a strong logic to it and there's solid theory underpinning it. Um, so that's kind of essentially what it was. Did we use it at the Yankees? Yeah, we, we, we did a bit with the fielders. Um, we didn't do too much with we, we didn't do too much with hitters, um, didn't do anything with the pitchers. Yeah, we did a bit with the fielders and it was one of those tools that the, the players enjoy it. The players really enjoy it. It's a little bit something different to add to, to practice, um, variety, a bit of fun. Um, and yeah, I, I, I like stroboscopic training. Nike don't make them anymore and actually it's kind of fizzled out a little bit. Um, but I do think there's something there and, you know, it might not be necessarily for reasons that are underpinned by sort of changes in the visual system. It might be sort of more psychological, but, you know, whatever improves the player is, is the main thing. Mm. Yeah. The, the thing I think of too, with say the visual training element is we work with a lot of team sports where there's change of direction and agility. And I think of people working on change of direction to be able to build the biomechanical patterns that you want to see, but then also considering the agility component. So that is to be able to change direction in response to an external perturbation or external stimulus. And I'm actually wondering whether there's any research looking into creating visual challenges in that agility type situation to actually further develop their visual skills to potentially enhance things like agility. Does anything like that actually exist? And oh, has any research been done in, into that? In terms of specific stroboscopic stuff, I'm not aware of anything. Um, mm. And, you know, that, that doesn't mean you know, that there isn't, but I'm not aware of anything stroboscopic wise that's looked at that. So maybe there's a gap for you in the market there. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to be me doing the research, but. <laughs> No, just because I often think with agility, people work a lot on the biomechanical elements and then try to bring into consideration visual um, external factors. But I also just wonder, would you potentially get an enhancement of agility capacity by challenging the visual system so that you become more acutely aware of those changes within an opponent's movement to better enhance your movement patterns? Hmm. No, I, yeah, I think it's an interesting idea. And I think it utilises arguably the, the, the main... Um, positive of stroboscopic training is that they are something that you use in situ. There's lots of visual tools out there that, you know, you're, you're playing around on the computer or you've got a light board and you're, you're tapping lights. You've probably seen stuff on Twitter, no doubt, where you've got athletes doing crazy things with lights. The stroboscopic glasses do have a huge benefit in that you, know, you can do your usual drills, but just under different visual conditions, which hopefully challenge you and, and um, maybe produce beneficial effects. Well, I think that that opens up that idea that development of skills often is, seems to be enhanced by creating constraints. Do you think that that is, you know, becoming more uh, clear in the research that 
constraints based approaches is is more effective than doing something without a constraint or is that not necessarily being sort of bought out with the research that's, that's going on i think i think you can't deny that there's more research you know every day every month that is providing evidence in support of constraints based approaches um you know, there's also research being produced that's that's making opposing arguments or, or more traditional arguments. But I do think there is a bit of a movement towards that um, that philosophy, and it's it's a philosophy that you know I I particularly agree with. And um, why, why I think do you agree has, with it so much? I think from what we from what research has been on sort of how we develop skills. It is not necessarily the speed at which we develop the skill that's important. It's how resistant that skill is under transfer conditions and under pressure conditions and things like that. We always talk about how we want to produce adaptable athletes as opposed to adapted athletes. And so that's the important thing with a skill is that, you know, can we produce an athlete that can then solve a different problem? under a different situation. Most sports, the same situation doesn't happen twice, um, especially in your, your Aussie rules and your soccer and things like that, such open sports. So you, you're not going to encounter the same circumstance twice. So producing an athlete that is really good at doing the same thing under repetitive circumstances, under the same situation, under the same circumstance, how much does that help us, you know, when it gets to the final of a competition or even just competition? Um, where those situations aren't going to be the same and when there's the added pressure and the added psychological elements to it. So because of that, I think the idea of the constraints-led approach and, and producing constraints that sort of force discovery and experimentation and self-guided learning, it all kind of makes sense from my perspective. And I think that, you know, the links... Um, it all, add, it all adds up, if that makes sense. The, the thing that I always think about, and, and I don't know the association, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on this between a constraints-led approach and the use of queuing and the type of queuing that's used, particularly internal versus external. You know, I was grateful enough to actually meet Nick Winkleman around the time that he was doing his PhD on, you know, this queuing type stuff. And... Um, you know, a lot of his discussion sort of centered around the use of external cues and the benefit that that was getting for, say, performance outcomes. Do you think that this is similar in some ways uh, that if you give people an, an instruction that allows them to interpret it in a way that creates some self-organization, that it's it actually gets a better outcome than if you're trying to direct one pathway? Um, which I think sometimes internal cues do that, where it's like, I want you to move your leg in this specific kind of plane or whatever it is. Yeah, I, I think they're, you know, they're, they're coming from the same sort of tree here in terms of the ideas and the philosophies underpinning it. So, um, yeah, there's absolutely some overlap and some shared beliefs and some shared mechanisms, I think, that work there, yeah. Um. So one of the things that I know you've done some research on as well, which is um, interesting to think about and explore is using virtual reality. So what kind of research have you done of using virtual reality in motor learning and what, what role do you think that can actually play in overall skill acquisition? Yeah, I'm, I'm a big, big proponent of virtual reality and um, I it's not a golden bullet, you know, it's not going to solve everything and it shouldn't be perceived as that. And I think that's where we sometimes get a little bit stuck is that people who do believe in the benefits of virtual reality have to kind of say, yeah, it's really good, but we kind of can't say it's too good <laughs> because then there's too many, the, the, the expectations get too high. So you've got to try and kind of balance those expectations with still selling it to people. Um, and so that's the, that's the tricky part that, that I guess more people that develop virtual reality systems have to encounter, but also people like myself as well. Uh, I think what VR does is it should be used to replace real world training, despite the fact that it's virtual reality. Okay? If anything, it's the opposite of that. 
It's allowing you to do things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do in reality. So in reality, in training, I'm going to... I'm, <laughs> I'm going to use Aussie rules in the example here, even though I've probably watched about 40 minutes of Aussie rules in my life. You and me both. There is a, <laughs> there's, a, there's a hell of a lot of Aussie, uh, there's a hell of a lot of players on the pitch at one time. You cannot train like that. It's almost impossible to go, okay, I want seven of you over there and six of you over there, and then we're going to run this play and we're going to practice it. And we're going to do that 10 times in a row, slight variations. It's impossible. But in VR, you can. Now, I'm not saying you should. That's just an example. Same with soccer. You can practice drills where, you know, you're practicing their decision-making and their perception of, of teammates and opposition players. And you can do it at the click of a button. You can adapt the environment so that there's four attackers behind the player. Now there's three attackers behind the player. Now there's two attackers. Yeah, you could probably do that in soccer in real life, but it's a lot of hassle for the coach. It's a lot of confusion. It's a lot of instructions that are being laid out. So it's not doing things that you do in the real world. It's doing the exact opposite, doing things you can't do in the real world. A nice one, going back to the baseball stuff, is, is showing a 20-year-old Dominican kid who's just come up from the DR, showing him a slider at 92 miles an hour or whatever it is. They've never seen that before in their life. But if they're going to make it to the pros, they need to see them. So we can show them things that they wouldn't necessarily experience in training or in practice or even in the games at the lower levels. We can show them that in VR and allow them to see things before they actually, allow them to see things and practice things before they actually really do need to see and practice those things. Um, and I think that's that's the really important thing, the message to get across to, to people when talking about VR. It's, it's doing things that we want to do but can't, as opposed to just repeating things in a VR headset. Do you think it creates the opportunity to really expand capability where you're going to such edge cases and you're pushing the parameters so far that you potentially, are, you know, you're enhancing their skills beyond what they'll ever experience? So rather than just being... Oh, you're being exposed to something that you will see, but you know, you're not ready for in the actual real world that we get to the point where, again, this would be a stupid example, but a slider coming in at 110 miles an hour, which is probably not likely to physically yeah. happen. Yeah. And, um, it's the question then that is that a bad thing or. No, the, the question is, do you think that it's going to potentially extend performance to levels we haven't seen before? You know, one of the things, uh, you know, Jack mentioned that I'm involved in track and field and we, we actually just finished another recording with someone who's an exercise physiologist and we got heavily into the discussion around shoes and the benefit that we've sort of come to this idea that with these super shoes, potentially the benefit is not actually so much wearing them on a one-off occasion, right? That does help, but maybe the benefit that we're seeing with such an improvement in performance is across large spans of people is that you can train in these things all the time. And we've, we've seen significant changes to the overall depth of fields across road events, across sprint events, track, whatever it is, but the whole field is better. And it seems almost disproportionate to just putting on the shoes and getting, you know, what do they say? Three or 4% improvement in efficiency or whatever it is. It seems like there's an accumulative training effect that you get from actually wearing these super shoes. And my thought is with VR, can you get that accumulative effect of pushing the boundary so far that almost these players, they go out to play and like, this is piss easy. Mm. Like I'm seeing the ball so <laughs> early that I'm just hitting it out of the park every single time. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting one. Um, it, it's definitely, it's definitely feasible. Like the technology is there to do it. Um, we never, we never tried anything like that. It'd be a very interesting question. And I'm sure you'd get players that would want to try it out. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's the same thing as me wanting to try out hitting an 80 mile an hour ball. Um, I can't do that. So I'm sure players will want to challenge themselves with, with higher ones. And would that then transfer? I don't know whether you'd, you'd want it to transfer. If they're never going to see it. <laughs> um, well, does it make in the same a way that the strobe, the stroboscopic glasses make it much like, or at least the perception that they have is that it's easier. Does it 
all of a yeah. sudden make the game seem like it's in slow motion if, if they're experiencing balls moving much quicker or, you know, in different light conditions or all sorts of things that they're not going to experience. And in fact, the real life is from a, even an objective measure easier. Will their perception mm. be, oh, this is, this is actually quite easy now. And, and I'm actually performing at a level of beyond that because my perception is that it's easier. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. And I, it's inspiring ideas for research, actually. So oh, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of anything, um, but I will have to have a quick look because if not, then I'm stepping in. Well, you know, like to give you an example, um, I don't know if you follow any of this stuff, but as you said, you mentioned social media before, there was a huge storm that blew up before the Olympics in 2021. The Italian athlete who ended up winning the gold medal in the 100, he and his coach were able to organize this system where they had basically it was like a horse float um put in front of him so it, it blocked wind resistance and he ran almost inside this sort of enclosed horse float thing on the track and he was able to run at 50 kilometers an hour which no human has ever been able to do under their own volition because there was a completely zero wind resistance um and everyone was like oh that's what got him to be able to win the gold medal because he wasn't at that level and we'll come to it, but the other one was the accusation of drugs. Um, but that to me th makes me think that potentially if you're taking people to levels beyond what they can produce in their own, under their own sort of control, whether it's from a perceptive point of view or even from a physical kind of experience point of view, it changes the goalposts. And, and you mentioned, you know, brain plasticity before. I feel like our brains are not limited by their ability to adapt. They're actually limited by the inputs that they can receive because typically we actually don't actually get those naturally occurring experiences. Yeah, I, I feel like we're on the, the edge of a really uh, different discussion, <laughs> which we can definitely get into. Um, oh, go, go for it. Uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, are, are we saying that that shouldn't be allowed? Or no, that I'm saying it should be allowed. I want to see performances that... Uh, yeah. Even as a track coach, you know, one of my motivations is to try and, you know, both for my athletes and even for the broader community, produce results that people didn't think were possible. Um, you know, and so if we can use whatever technology we have, we, uh, you know, we use different skill sets, different coaching approaches, different scientific, you know, technologies to enhance that. Great. Like, I think it's fantastic that we, we try and explore it because as much as um, some people may not think that this is you know, what human endeavor about, I think genuine humanism as a movement is about seeing what the human race is capable of. And in a sporting sense, I think it's seeing performances that we previously didn't think were maybe possible. No, I, I agree. I, you know, the, the arguments that you can have on this is sort of fairness, um, like you said, the sporting endeavor, and I guess safety. And in my mind, safety, is the important one, but I'm not too fussed with fairness. No, neither sport am I. <laughs> is not sport's not fair. Like if sport was no. fair, then I would have been born six foot five, so I could compete in everything else. But you know, that's that's not the way it works. So um, yeah, we're kind of dancing around this idea of, sort of you know what is fair and, and should you know certain things be allowed. And that, that to me is not the question. As long as something's no. safe, I I'm all for okay, let's try and see what we can achieve. Okay, well, I think this steps into some of the discussion about drugs. Um, and the reason we bring that up is because you have actually done some research in doping and, and the mindset and morality. And I know it's not an area that you're spending as much of your research time in, but it'd be interesting to get an idea of what you found looking into the perceptions, the mindsets and, and the way in which people who do decide to potentially go down that path have, because I think it's a very interesting actual discussion from an intellectual level of why someone might actually choose to go down that path and how they justify that. Yeah, it's, it's such an interesting conversation. And, you know, we've been talking for a while now, and I feel like this could be the start of our conversation now and we could go, but we won't. Um, we will. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the study that we did, you know, I, I've been interested in this for quite a long time, actually. I almost did a, uh, a postdoc in this as opposed to carrying on down the vision and perception side of things. 
Um, and we wanted to basically, the, the mindset stuff from Carol Dweck came out probably around about this time that I was thinking of this as sort of, you know, Carol Dweck stuff is, is 20 odd plus years old. Yeah. Um, but it, it grew in popularity, I think, because of the book that she produced in around about the 2010, 12, yeah. something like that. Um, so anyway, I read that and then I was like, okay, well, is it a case that people who don't believe that their abilities and their efforts, or sorry, that their efforts cause their ability, yeah, logically, could it be that they're more likely to, you know, dope or, or be receptive to doping or at least have more positive attitudes towards doping? Um, so that stemmed the question of essentially, is mindset linked to doping? Um, and so we, we explored that with, uh, university student athletes who is probably the general sample that you, you get in this sort yeah. of research. It's not the greatest sample in the world, but you know, we, we took them from a couple of universities that are two of the better sports universities in, in the UK. Um, and we did, we, we found a relationship between mindset and doping such that if you had a growth mindset, i.e. you thought that your abilities were a product of your um, efforts and, and other factors as well, but that's the key thing, I guess, um, you were less positive towards doping, i.e. you know, you, you frowned upon it more and um, you were less um, tempted by, by doping scenarios and, and those sorts of things, which I, th I think is quite an interesting finding. And it was a novel finding as well. So, uh, nobody had sort of looked at those two different concepts before. Do you think that that separates, you know, this, this you know, it's obviously one aspect of someone's mindset, you know, whether they are more fixed or, or growth in their, their sort of perception of how they can, you know, as you said, influence the outcome. Do you think that that actually has any links with, you know, moral standards that they have for themselves or for others? Or do you think that they're unrelated areas of, of their internal psychology? Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, I'm going to have to, I'm gonna have to pass that over to someone else and get back to you on that one. Cause I'm not, I'm not sure to be honest. Um, I'd have well, to give it a proper, proper thought. And what, what do you no, think? No. Well, I don't know either, but the reason I ask it is because there's this perception that doping is immoral. You know, you're, you're cheating. Hmm. But I think, as you just mentioned, the people who do dope, they don't necessarily see it as cheating because they see it sometimes as evening the fairness. They actually almost see it as them catching up to the field. There's often the excuse used that everyone else is doing it. So it's not that they're putting hmm. themselves ahead of people they actually often describe, and I don't know this because I don't know anyone who's specifically doped or, or coaches that are involved in this process, but there seems to be this overriding message that goes out that they, I agree with you, it seems like it almost matches that, that they feel like they're inferior and they're only trying to catch up. So they don't see that what they're doing is wrong. They see it as I'm actually creating more fairness, which if fairness is something high in their value structure, potentially they're actually acting more in line with their morals than what people would perceive. And it's actually from that perspective, almost more ethical, which sounds ludicrous to say, but it, it seems to me that those things are not necessarily aligned where, you know, if they think that their performance can't be improved with their efforts, then they actually need to even this out by potentially doing something like doping. Yeah. And so, I think, I think I see where you're coming from. And I think from that perspective, it's not a question of less or more moral. It's a question of what we would say is disengaging from morals. So you could, you know, you, every, they, two athletes could have the same morals and the same sort of absolute values. But if one is able to disengage because of, ex, not excuses, but because of reasons that they think are fair, then that changes their doping behaviors and it changes their doping attitude. So, so yeah, perhaps it's that sort of ability to dis disengage from morals rather than the moral value per se. Hmm. I, I know that you'd probably be very um, on top of probably more than myself, uh, the work of Julian Savalescu. 
No, you're going to have to uh, yeah. teach me on that one. Well, you, you, the way that you sort of described fairness and and uh, and safety before made me think of, of Julian's work. Julian's a, a doping ethicist. His research is in, is in doping ethics. And he put forward an interesting argument, which I have to admit I agree with, even as a track coach who would never encourage someone to dope. I kind of agree with the stance that he takes, which is that the two main factors that you need to consider in relation to this issue and most issues in relation to, to sport are how does it meet on the fairness, um, you know, parameter and how does it meet on, on safety? So basically what he did was when he discussed it, he said, well, from a point of view of fairness, we actually cannot ensure fairness at all um, in this sport, sporting context, because as you mentioned before, there's genetic factors, there's exposure factors, there's resources, there's coaching opportunities, there's, you know, facilities, all sorts of things. So to say that, limiting one factor, i.e. pharmaceutical interventions and access to them is more fair or less fair than limiting resources to say coaching or facilities or financial reimbursement is actually probably not that accurate. You know, would someone taking uh, pharmaceutical ergogenic aids improve them more than them having access to, you know, good nutrition, good coaching, good facilities and financial reimbursement? I don't know. I don't think anyone's necessarily done a research to say, oh, this one improves you 3% and this one improves you 8% or whatever the numbers might be. And based off that, he said, well, the only other factor that is of significant relevance is athlete safety. And I think everyone would agree. Yeah. Athlete safety is, is extremely valuable. We don't want people taking up their career um, in professional sport and then having lifelong health detriments um, and we saw, obviously, the disasters that came out of what happened with, say, East Germany and the Soviet stuff, you know, people having to even have, um, you know, gender reassignment because they were so, like, was one female shot putter, uh, Heidi mm. Kruger, who ended up having uh, gender reassignment because she was uh, so, andro- uh, like, you know, her, her features had become so, andro- I can't even say the word, androgenized, um, that she was more akin to being male in her features than females who decided to actually go through with gender reassignment surgery. Um, that seems like it's well beyond the features of, you know, athlete safety. However, what Julian put forward is nothing in the current doping strategies actually ensures athlete health in any way. All it does is it ensures that they don't have levels of ergogenic aids in their system. It does, they don't check to see, oh, is your liver function good? They just check whether you have drugs in your system. So you, you could be taking drugs and they've cleared in time and your liver is about to pack it in, but they don't care about that. That's not their concern. They're not concerned about your health. They're actually concerned about whether you actually took the actual ergogenic aid itself. So the argument that he puts forward is maybe we need a system that does protect these things, which would be a lot more open to drugs, but a lot of people, you know, or so-called ethical or moral reasons don't seem to like it. Now, I know that's a a long run and it's probably not really a question on there, but I just think it's particularly interesting that we're in a position where, especially in places like the UK, where you're from and Australia, we have this very visceral reaction to when we hear one of our sporting stars is doping. And unfortunately, I think it's a lot more complicated than just saying this person's cheating or not cheating. And there's a lot more features that probably need to be discussed um, in order for us to actually get to a position that's healthier for everyone. And I say that both psychologically and physically in the sporting sort of domain, particularly for athletes, because um, I don't know, you, you're probably aware, recently the big shitstorm that happened with Peter Boll, the Australian 800 metre runner. Um, are you aware of that case? No. So Peter Bowles, an Australian 800-meter uh, runner, finished fourth at the Olympics a couple of years ago. Um, he actually, you know, we're close with his coach. Uh, we actually had him on the podcast uh, a few months back. And in early January, I think it was, came out, he's had an adverse finding uh, for EPO. Now, interesting, every, you know, the first point that came up, everyone in the Australian athletics community really defended him, said he's the nicest bloke in the world, he wouldn't cheat. He came out and said, no, I'm not a cheater, I don't, you know, I've got no interest in that. 
And interestingly, like even a couple of days later, I saw his coach and, you know, the, the poor guy looked like he hadn't slept in weeks, right? He clearly was aghast at the fact that he he didn't believe that this was likely. Um, all the behaviours around it were always very much about not doping and all those kind of things. And they were super safe with all of their reporting and whereabouts and all that kind of thing. And the mental toll that it took on Pete in that period was pretty significant. Then he goes through the process of getting his B sample tested and it comes back and he gets cleared. Right. So it's a really interesting case because, and we spoke about this actually briefly with a couple of uh, barristers that we had on this podcast where I said, I find doping really interesting because it's that along with parking fines is basically the only area of common law where it's strict liability. We don't care how it happened. You've got to prove that you didn't do it. Right. Hmm. Whereas all other areas of law, it's, you know, expect your, the expectation is that you're innocent until proven guilty. And I understand why in doping they can't do that, but I feel like it creates such a huge legal problem. It creates so many resources having been put around doping itself the amount of testing that goes on, chasing people around the world, all sorts of stupid shit that doesn't seem like one, it's ensuring athlete safety. And if you dive into it, it's probably not even doing fairness. You know, it's probably not actually achieving that in the way that we think. So, uh, you know, and I know I've just been talking nonstop for probably the last 10 minutes, but essentially I, I think doping is an area that needs much more discussion and it needs to be much more open because the toll that it takes, I think, on athletes and coaches is not commensurate with the, uh, the, the areas that it says that it's trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's so many good points there. And it reminded me of a few things. Uh, one, it, you know, when you're saying about the toll it takes on the athletes, it reminds me, uh, maybe it was a... Maybe it was something I watched, maybe it was something I read, but, you know, the, the experiences that sort of a 13, 14, 15-year-old female gymnast or swimmer has to go through if they, if they get picked for a random drugs test. Yeah. Now, it might be that they have to, you know, urinate in front of a 50-year-old man. Do you know what I mean? Because of these are the systems and protocols that we have in place. And it's at some point just like you were saying there with the psychological toll that it took on the coach and the play and the athlete <laughs> at some point, is it better to just allow a few cheats to get away with it? <laughs> That's the question well, that I, I mean, it's, it's, that yeah, I genuinely right. think you could, you could make that case of, look, I would rather a bunch of um, teenagers, boys and girls don't have to go through those sorts of experiences and that other people don't get unfairly accused yeah, a few people will slip through the net. Um, I think you could make the case. I'm not saying it's a great case, but... Well, yeah. I think one of the interesting parts about this too is whether we start to see particularly professional sport as... I think one of the big factors behind this is, you know, the historicism, particularly of amateur sports, uh, where they weren't allowed to be paid and obviously things like doping were heavily controlled. If you go to some of the newer professional sports... One, drugs is seen as almost laughable because a lot of people are doing it and no one cares. Um, and even more recently, I've seen discussions, particularly online, of, say, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is becoming more popular. It's being, um, you know, it's becoming popularized by the people that are involved in it and also by some of the big proponents. You know, people like Joe Rogan actually have had a lot of guests on that are from that. Um, Lex Friedman, his podcast as well. And one of the interesting things, there's no testing in you know, the top level of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You know, the guy that's the top of the top at the moment is a guy named Gordon Ryan. And the guy looks like a Greek god. And it's, it's you know, it's been openly discussed that he's taking steroids and there is no issues with it for the simple reason that there's no testing in the sport and they don't control for it. However, the popularity of the sport is increasing and it makes me think, are we actually being old fashioned to think that sport is this holier than thou pursuit rather than seeing it for what it is now professionally, which is mostly actually entertainment. And if that's the case, mm. do we care about these very stringent controls or do we care more that we're seeing a product that is useful for us to actually, you know, there are 
benefits to sport and society, both at encouraging um, you know, certain types of physical activity and also the inspiration that it creates for different types of behavior. However, can we see it as maybe it's actually shifted more towards entertainment and then for that reason, controlling something like that is actually not as important? Yeah, I, I, again, I, I think there's a lot of good points. The one thing I would push back and say is that you do have, someone has to be responsible for athletes and protecting them from themselves. Mm. You know, if you've worked in elite sport, you'll know that athletes trust their coaches so much. And if a coach said to do something, if a coach says to a 14 year old athlete, you know, that they've worked with for three years, jump, the, the athlete will say how high. Yeah. So there is an element of we've got to protect them from themselves because someone has to. Um, they may want to do it. They may want to engage in, in, in whatever. Um, yeah, it, it's a difficult. It's a difficult one. Um, if you could, if you could know that it was purely their decision, it was one hundred percent their decision. Then I do think you've got a strong case of just saying, look, this is an entertainment business. This is a what's the limits of human pursuit and performance um, scale. But I don't think in reality that's the case. Uh, I, like we'll, we'll move on to something else, but I think you're 100 percent right. I think unfortunately at the time of their life, they're not necessarily thinking about the long-term ramifications. So even if they are giving so-called informed consent, I think that they're not necessarily valuing their long-term health in a way that would be reflected in the decisions they make in that competitive environment. You know, you mentioned the competitiveness of these very elite athletes. They would take sometimes those decisions in a direction that would end up causing long-term damage and it does need to be protection from that. So I think you, you brought up an extremely important point. Yeah, just one final point on that, just because you're talking about the long time thing, long term effects on everything. Um, you know, if in an ideal world, we would test for the effects of the drugs, not the drugs themselves, right? We would test for a dangerously large heart because that's the thing that is going to be the, the, the dangerous factor. It's not the steroids themselves, it's what the steroids do. But the big thing is we don't know what we don't know. And because we can't do research on <laughs> steroid use in sports, we're not going to find out the, the 30 year effect of even moderate use, even seeming, not seemingly safe use, but even sort of mild use of steroids. And it, it's that sort of pushback that I think is valid that, you know, we, we don't know the long term, we don't know the, the full effects of it. So interesting conversation. Though. Yeah. Um, a question we always like to ask our guests is, is this something that you're currently learning about or exploring either within your profession, but also also outside of your profession in your personal life that is particularly interesting you at the moment or getting you excited? Uh, sports related or just anything? Could be anything. Yeah, anything. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, as probably everyone, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in the whole AI stuff. Um, always listening to those New York times podcasts, the hard fork, the Ezra Klein stuff. Um, so I think that's fascinating. And I'm always, whenever, to be honest, whenever I am listening to anything or watching or reading anything that's not sports related, I am always thinking of how do I apply this to sport as well? Um, so haven't got anything just yet on that, but I do think it's super fascinating. So from a non-sports focused uh, aspect, I'd say that um, from a sports focused aspect, you know, VR use, we've already talked about it, but it's only going to grow. Um, and so being at the forefront of that now, I think it's a pretty exciting thing to be part of. And um, I'd encourage anyone to just check it out and then, and then have an opinion and judge. Actually, can I ask a selfish question? Absolutely. As a sprint coach, one of the perceptions that the athletes often give me is that when we, ru when we run in low light, so sometimes at our training venue, the, the, uh, the lights are not particularly strong. As they're running along, they get this perception that they're running faster because it's dark. And they always feel like it's a lot faster. And I've thought about this for a long time. 
could you actually do a lot of training in low light to basically create this perception in your brain that you're moving quicker and would it potentially ever convert to you being able to run faster? That is another really interesting question. My first thought is... Um, because, well, and I'll put the caveat on here, is when I time them, they're not actually running faster. Okay, so it is just purely perception. Yes. So the first thing I thought of was when uh, there's a lot of good research where you blur people, you put sort of contact lenses in with blur or glasses with blur, and then you get them to do tasks like bat a cricket ball or catch a ball. And actually it takes a lot of blur to negatively affect someone's performance. So I guess thinking of it from that visual perspective and sort of their, so to go back, the reason that they don't get worse when batting under blur is probably because they just work harder at it. They're concentrating more and they're focusing more. And that extra focus negates the, the possible decrement. And I guess maybe it's the flip side of that for you guys is that maybe because it's darker, maybe they have to work a little bit harder. Maybe they have to concentrate a little bit more. Maybe they're a little bit more motivated um, to not necessarily be better, but to stop the decrease that would otherwise happen under dark conditions. And maybe that's why the, the, the times are the same, um, but they think they're moving faster. I don't know. It's a really interesting one. Again, another possible research idea that's pretty straightforward to set up, actually. It actually makes me think, John, of what is the information that we use to determine our speed? Is it actually visual and the light? Mm. And, and when you take that away and they're thinking of more ground contacts and, and say, foot or leg speed, that's perhaps a feedback for the speed that they're not as, it's not as tuned in, hence they're probably getting um, incorrect feedback. Yeah. Mm. No, I just, I've always thought about this because... I, the thought that came to my head when, you know, a lot of my athletes would say this, obviously during COVID particularly, we, we copped it with this because we, you know, we were pretending we weren't training, but we were. And um, we often didn't have lights at all. So we'd, we'd train until it basically got as dark as it could get and we would nearly not be able to see anything. They say, oh, I'm flying, you know, I'm flying, I'm going so fast. Um, you say, well, the time, the, the stopwatch doesn't say you're going any faster than you normally do. Um but their perception was there. And I thought it'd be interesting to actually do a study where, you know, or even some training where you said, all right, you're going to run with blindfolds or you're going to run um, low light or whatever it is. So that your visual perception is much less. Would it actually change that perceptive input? And could that potentially even improve your performance? Because, you know, your body thinks it's moving quicker. And then when you add the light back in, it tries to recreate that same feeling. Or if nothing else, whether it actually helps you to, be able to improve your biomechanics because all of a sudden you're starting to get better, more accurate feedback from leg movement and joint positions. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I'd be intrigued to see if it applies and maybe you can tell me, is this across the board? Like do the fastest sprinters you've got have the same perceptions as, as the slower ones or is there not enough of a range in your, your athletes? Uh, there is, but I wouldn't say that necessarily – like I haven't surveyed them properly to say, do you perceive it to be different? Like, also, <laughs> it, It's just kind of been a general passing comment. And it's the same, like it's the same perception that you tend to get. Um, we don't really have indoor tracks, but I do remember for people who are listening who used to remember that we used to have a, a track uh, used to be based across from the MCG called Olympic Park. And there was a hallway that ran underneath the stadium um, that they'd put rubber down. And it was just a hallway, but as kids, I remember just being idiots and running down the hallway and the perception, particularly because it was such a closed environment, made you feel like you were actually moving a lot faster because you were kind of indoors in this enclosed environment. And I don't know whether it's just because the perceptive information you're getting visually is different, but I've always thought about whether training in that environment consistently would change, you know, your understanding or even visually what you try and recreate when there's none of that um or you know potentially does nothing but uh, i've just always thought about this yeah that that's project number four that you inspired <laughs> from uh, today's conversation we'll, we'll, send, we'll send you the questions that you can, uh, you can put into research papers for us if you yeah i just have to back, that'd be great yeah i'd have to re-listen to this to our own podcast and make notes so. <laughs> all right we probably won't hold you up anymore so 
Luke, thank you so much for your time. We really enjoyed it and we really appreciate having people like yourself who are experts coming on to talk to two absolute idiots like us. <laughs> no, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, mate. Thanks, guys. Bye.